afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. The Information Technology and General Services Committee will now come to order. Uh, understand that if you feel compelled to have a conversation with somebody and you go behind this little wall right here, we can hear you better from back there. So if you do need to do that, go all the way outside the doors. Uh, and the only people who should be speaking uh, are the ones who are here at the table on the items that are scheduled to be heard today. In addition to that, if you want to fill out a public comment card, you can get it in the back here. Um, there's a little desk with the public comment card. You fill it out, give it to the clerk to my left, and uh, we will call you up according to that item or if you're here for general public comment. With that, We'll uh, announce that on items number two and number 11, we'll continue those items in this committee. So if you're here for items number two or number 11, those items will be continued. Uh, they will not be heard in today's committee. And also, um, we'll move items from this committee on consent, items number six, 12, and 13. Are there any public comment cards on items six, 12, and 13? There are no public comment cards. Okay, no public comment time. cards on items 6, 12, and 13. Therefore, those items will be moved uh, for approval without discussion. Next, we will take uh, item 1 uh, first, and then after that, we will go to item number 8. Item number 1. Item number one, CAO report and ordinance relative to the proposed sale of surplus property located at 8101 South Vermont Avenue. Diana Mangiolu, Office of the CAO. Um, GSD requested that our office report back on the proposed sale of surplus property uh, to the Community Coalition. The property is located in CD8. It's 8101 South Vermont. The original purchase price in 1981 was $175,000. The property is now being sold for $1,050,000. Um, per the Code of Federal Reg Regulations, since the property was acquired and improved with CDBG funding, um, the proceeds of the sale will be recognized as program income. And as outlined in recommendations uh, one through five, this office recommends a proposed sale. Okay. Um, and we're here to answer any questions you may have. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, can you explain for the benefit of the community, uh, should this item be approved by the committee, uh, then what the next steps are for us to finalize this process? Uh, we have staff from GSD here, and I think they'll do a better job at detailing okay. that. GSD? Good afternoon, Lourdes Owen from Asset Management General Services. After ITGS approves the, the uh, item, the sale to uh, the community coalition, it'll go to full council and council will approve it. Once approved by council, the mayor will sign the uh, sale ordinance, which will take effect 30 days from the day the, the mayor signs off on it. Then escrow can be open and we have at least uh, 60 to 90 days escrow and uh, once escrow closes the funds are with the city of la gsd then the property is transferred to uh, the other party so then the uh, buyer will then be the official owner of the property and they will appear on the grant deed not the city of los angeles from that moment forward correct okay. yes all right um thank you for that clarification uh, we have public comment cards on this item, Norris Bird and Alberto Retana. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alberto Retana. I'm the uh, director of organizing at Community Coalition. Our executive director is in Seattle today raising funds for our organization, so he couldn't make it and wanted to uh, definitely express his, his uh, deepest commitment to supporting this, this proposal. Uh, Community Coalition was formed in 1990 in response to the crack epidemic uh, that was 
uh, taking a, a hold of our communities throughout the nation, particularly in South Los Angeles. And we were formed in, to create a space for community members to get involved in campaigns to address the social and economic conditions to transform uh, that, that it are the root causes for, the re for addiction. A lot of our members of Community Coalition are here today. I'm not going to ask you to stand, but you could definitely raise your hand. Are very excited about being here. In April of, of 2008, uh, Councilmember Bernard Parks made a commitment with us that within 60 days uh, he would move us, move this agenda item through City Council. And uh, we are pleased to see him champion our cause to take this uh, and, and run with it and create an opportunity for an organization like our own to own its own building. We're anxious. We can't wait to be homeowners and uh, very anxious to get through this process because we've been uh, going at it for about six years now. So when the council member made his promise and has delivered, it's been a huge victory for the community and a huge victory for Community Coalition. We moved in in February of 1997. Uh, we've been there for over 10 years. We've uh, maintained a, the building in impeccable condition. Uh, we've invested close to $30,000 in retrofits and maintaining the building. Uh, which is very different from the previous uh, lessee, which was there from 81 to 89. And in the report talks about uh, liens on the city due to failure to pay a payroll tax. We have uh, been completely the opposite type of uh, lessee where we've invested, we've kept it in really good condition, and most importantly, have helped the community. I want to thank the committee, uh, thank uh, Councilmember Parks for hearing this agenda and for moving it forward. Okay, thank you. My name is Mrs. Norris Byrd. I'm a member of the Community Coalition, and I would like to thank you all for hearing our proposal today concerning the property at 8101 South Vermont. It is indeed a wonderful thing for ownership to take place in these days and time. We normally look at so many foreclosures, irregardless of the circumstances that we have been around, we have held close together as a team and as a family to keep the coalition intact. We know sometimes we have ups and downs, but we have waited patiently. We didn't give up. We didn't give in. We knew one day we would get the grace and we would own the property one day, some way, somehow. We would like to thank Councilman Parks in his absence for thinking of us, of what we are doing for the community and keeping the community together. We need more of these type of organizations to come in and do positive things for the community. So once again, we thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, is there anybody else here who came to speak on item number one uh, besides these two speakers? Seeing and hearing none. Uh, public comment on item number one is now closed. And with that, what we will do is uh, we'll, because we do not have a quorum, it will be a recommendation of the chair to approve the item and move it out of this committee. Thank you very much and congratulations. Also, please understand. Um, I know sometimes people get a little nervous and they don't want to get up and, and if they have somewhere else to go and think they have to stick around for the whole committee. You do not have to stick around for this whole committee. There's probably going to be things that you're more than welcome to listen to, but you might find them a little boring or confusing, uh, very different from the item that uh, you came to listen to. So you're welcome to, uh, to move on if you wish. Uh, once again, it's a public hearing. You're welcome to stay. Um, if you fall asleep, I, I warned you. Uh, but uh, congratulations to all of you who came to hear item number one. Now we move to item number eight. Item number eight, joint mayor, controller, CAO, and information technology agency report relative to delay in negotiations in connection with the contract for implementing the financial management system, FMS, related matters. Thank you. Randy Levin, ITA, and I'm joined by Rushmore Cervantes with the City Controller's Office. Ray Serrano with the Office of CAO. Okay. 
Um, we're in the process of negotiating now with CGI AMS on the contract. There's about um, 26 exhibits that have to get negotiated and we're making, I think, pretty tremendous progress through this process. Um, <clears throat> we're trying to iron out the scope and we're also trying to be very mindful of what the post implementation support is going to look like for this software once we go live. Yeah, the uh, terms and conditions are being ironed out uh, by the city attorney's office uh, with their attorneys mm -hmm. and uh, they actually just met uh, today and will be meeting throughout this week and of the exhibits there's about seven or eight that we need to finalize before we have the entire package ready to move forward to have come to this committee and to the full council for support. There is money in the budget for next fiscal year, $15 million in MICLA to debt finance the project as well as rollover monies, about $7.3 million in the GCP that will be f utilized to fund salaries for both ITA and controller staff for next fiscal year. Now, should everything go well uh, with this negotiation and we move forward with this contract, when will the uh, system be fully uh, operational? It'll be two years. Two years? Mm -hmm. So mid-2010? The, the goal is July 2010. 2010. We want to begin the be at the beginning of a fiscal year. Okay. Now, between now and 2010, where does that leave us? What, what's the situation? Well, we'll be running on the existing legacy system that we have in place right now. Um, and, and while we're in the process of doing that, though, we hope to help with the financial reporting and operational reporting as we go through this process. Really, we're, we're really going to leave the system alone as much as possible and not try and make any modifications to it, try and leave it in a very stable state and utilize what resources we have to focus on the new system. Mm -hmm. We've been also looking at physical space for the project team. You want to talk about that? Uh, certainly. We were working with the Department of General Services Asset Management Division that identified a space currently uh, at the is it Garland. Garland Building where CDD and Housing Department are. And apparently there is some space there that about 25,000 square feet that we'll need for both the staff uh, of the city departments but as well as the subject matter experts that will be there for short periods of time as well as the staff for the consultants. Mm. And how does it look long term as far as maintenance of this system after 2010? Or is it going to be a mixture of city staff or is it going to be third party uh, providers? What's the likelihood? I know that may change, but how does it look now? Well, we're, we're working through that right now um, because it's important for us to figure this out now so that we don't overhire or overstaff if we're going to require more vendor support. So I, it, there's going to be some mixture there. We're just trying to figure out what the mixture is going to look like so that we can have the best possible support model. It's also important to note that this is a scaled down version that we're talking about to go live July 2010. This is just the financial core. We've really pared it down. So you're going to have support for that system once it goes live. But in addition to that, uh, we're also most likely going to be looking to taking out other systems, or I shouldn't say taking out, but adding to this core function, which could include procurement, a budget system, a variety of other functions that we did not have for this particular implementation for phase one. We're looking at this as a multiple phased approach. It's better to go with a multiple phased approach so that we can actually show some wins along the way and, and not make this a three or year, four year project and just wait three or four years before we put anything in. So I think that this is probably a conservative yet doable um, scenario for us to be able to get through this in the next two years. Okay. Anything from the CAO's office? I think they pretty much have, have covered it or provided an update at this point. Obviously, it's a, it's a, the project is certainly we need to get started um, with the, all the issues that we have with the SMS. Um, as we look to, for phase one and phase two, uh, it, it's, we've secured the funding uh, for next year, and, and I think we were sort of in a, a spot that we're, we need to move forward and get going. Okay. And um, how long do you anticipate it should take to close down the negotiation on the last uh, what, seven or so points? Well, it probably over the next several weeks. 
it, it shouldn't take that much longer. There are just some, some minor uh, elements they're trying to address. Uh, this was essentially uh, put in abeyance for a year. They were originally, our, our, our attorneys were working with their attorneys a year ago. So we began in earnest once again about six weeks ago. So they've uh, gone through a lot of the exhibits. So we're just about done. So we'll anticipate within the next two to three weeks. And we uh, will be ready to uh, come forward with a report shortly thereafter. Okay. Um, I made a commitment to uh, make sure that as soon as it's ready, it will go through the process as quickly as possible. Um, I have met uh, with Ms. Levin uh, on this matter as well, um, and with your um, answering some of these questions publicly, I will keep that commitment. And at this time, uh, as a recommendation of the chair, uh, first, there appear to be no uh, public comment cards on this item. There is a public comment card, but it, isn't, it looks like general public comment. Just Any, general. There's no comment on this okay. particular item. Anybody here for item number eight? Seeing and hearing none, public comment is open on item number eight. It is now closed. Um, with that, it will be a recommendation of the chair to move this along. It will be going to budget and finance. Um, if, uh, if we don't, if the chairman of the budget and finance doesn't tell me that by the middle of June that this is ready to be heard, I'm going to request of the council president we bring it back to this committee and then ask some more questions. But at this time, I think that it's important for that we, that we move expeditiously. It is going to go through the finance committee of the city council before going to the floor of the council. So at this time, the recommendation of the chair is going to be to move it out of this committee so that uh, next time it will be heard when it's done with these final points, you'll be uh, speaking before the budget and finance committee. Great. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay. Um, you. Mr. Chair, for purposes of disposition, is this a note and file or are we no action taken if we just forward it to the next committee? Uh, no action taken. Very good. Now move to item number three. Item number three, CAO report in response to motion Smith Garcetti Wiesar relative to city vehicle use policies and related matters. Tyler Munhall, CAO. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the, the report responds to two motions uh, from council members uh, Smith and Garcetti and yourself and Parks requesting information relative to the city fleet, uh, rules for its use, especially home garaging, how other governmental entities uh, handle the use of their fleets. The report provides information on these items and recommends that the re report be noted and filed. I'm available to answer any questions. Okay. All right. Is there anybody here to make public comment on item number three? We're now on item number three. Public comment on item number three is open. Uh, seeing and hearing none, public comment on item number three is not closed. Um, what seems to be the uh, major policy difference or, is, or are there many differences between the lease policies here at the city and that of the county? The county has a, a fairly complex system uh, with several tiers um, that executives and electeds fall under. Um, and there are multiple options. You can, uh, if you fall into the right, the right tier, you can lease a car and you get an allowance to lease the car. Um, all of the, anyone can be assigned a vehicle, anyone that's eligible to get a vehicle. If there's a, so the, and I, the policies also, um, 
well, they're more complex than ours. Whereas ours, all, all electeds, all general managers are assigned a city-owned vehicle. There's no lease involved. And our electeds are able to use uh, city vehicles for personal use um, without limit because they're on call 24 hours. And the state? Well, the state, as, you, as you're aware, um, we, we only got verbal information from them, um, which involved, you can uh, lease a vehicle, the elected, or the state leases a vehicle, and the elected pays 10% of the lease and is limited to personal use of 10% of the miles on the vehicle. And what would it take to adopt that? Uh, hybrid which is different than our current policy right it, it actually is more restrictive than our policy um, we would we would need to look at that and uh, probably GSD would need to be involved in evaluating that okay anybody here from GSD who can speak to this at all okay Tony DeClue, General Services Department, Fleet Operations. Um, yeah, the, the state policy of the 10% pay and the 10% personal use, how, uh, what, how long would it take for you to analyze that and to compare it to what we currently have in the city? We'll give you back at uh, 30, two weeks or 30 days, whichever suits you. All right, 30 days. Okay. Pretty quick. Thank you. Good. I know you're busy. Thank you. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so... With this item, uh, what we'll do is uh, get a report back from uh, General Services on this item and specifically relative to the uh, differences between the city policy and the state policy on uh, the use of city vehicles. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, This time we'll move to item number seven. Item number seven, report from the Public Safety Committee relative to reducing the record retention period for LAPD in-car video imagery. This item was referred to committee by council action on April 2nd, 2008. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm June Gibson with the CLA. This item is uh, related to the installation of uh, in-car video cameras in black and whites and the costs of complying with the current administrative code requirement to retain uh, video um, images for a minimum of five years. Uh, we're recommending that the ad code be amended to establish a minimum two-year retention period for in-car video imagery. Um, as the chair may recall, um, approximately six weeks ago, the council had approved a contract with IBM uh, for the installation of phase one of the in-car video project uh, in South Bureau. That's for the installation of approximately uh, 300 uh, cameras. Uh, the cost of that contract was $5.5 million, um, which assumed that the um, storage would be for a period of two years. Um, what we have provided in our report, <clears throat> excuse me, if I can direct the uh, chair's attention to the bottom of page three, is a summary of the costs if we were to um, extend the storage um, in increments of uh, one year. If we were to um, retain the current policy, um, the costs for um, retention for just the South Bureau alone would be approximately $600,000 per year. Um, if we expanded the installation on a department-wide basis, the costs could be as much as $3.2 million per year. So from a cost-beneficial standpoint, um, we agree with the LAPD um, that the reduction of the um, video imagery for um, in-car video only should be uh, amended to accommodate the two-year period. 
Um, I think it's important to emphasize that our recommendation in no way is going to um, impact um, the LAPD's longstanding policy with, with uh, respect to evidence that's captured in connection with criminal proceedings or investigations of misconduct. Um, the current policy within the LAPD is that the um, evidence that's retained um, is for an extensive, extensive period of time and in some cases it's retained indefinitely. So what we're really talking about are what we would categorize as non-events um, or dead air, uh, essentially um, video that may capture um, an individual that, that is stopped um, as a result of patrol, uh, but there is no incident that occurs and no complaint has been filed um, and no criminal proceeding um, uh, occurs in, in connection with that stop. How long does a person have, how long does a citizen have to uh, register a complaint from the time of the incident? Um, they have one year from the date of the incident if it's involving misconduct. The statute of limitations for a criminal proceeding is two years. So one year and two years, what's the difference? <clears throat> I'm going to have uh, Chief Beck come to the table as well as uh, Julie Raffish from the City Attorney's Office. Councilman Howard. Morning. Afternoon, afternoon, I should Sorry. Charlie Beck, Chief of Detectives. Julie Raffish, City Attorney's Office. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And uh, June is exactly right on the, on the statute of limitations. Uh, uh, by uh, state law, we have a year from date of occurrence for uh, misconduct. And then uh, Julie can speak to the, uh, to the um, civil side of it, but I, I believe you to be right on that also. Um, as a point of clarification, I believe the statute of limitations for bringing a personnel complaint or for investigating a complaint is generally one year, but I believe it's one year from the date that the incident becomes Discovered. known to the police department. So I, it's not the date of occurrence necessarily if okay. there's a lag time between the date of occurrence and the date it becomes known to the police department. Okay. okay. Um, say, for example, uh, something occurs on January 15th of 2007 okay. and somebody notifies the police department or the city in some official fashion that they're making a complaint. So if a person does that within a few months, that's well within any statute or any interpretation, correct? That's correct. But being that it took place on January 15th, 2007, if the person walks in on January 20th, 2008, the that, person has a right to bring that yes, forward? Yes. They, they have a right to, to bring it forward at any time after the incident occurs. But the statute of limitations, the one-year period, doesn't start clicking away until it becomes known to the city and the police department. That there is a complaint. Right. Now, if this incident takes place on January 15, 2007, and all of a sudden somebody comes in with some kind of official notification to the city or the police department, five years later, right. then we have to do our best to try to re familiarize ourselves with what occurred so that we could appropriately explain. Council, we'll take complaints. I'm getting at. We'll, yeah, we'll take complaints 20 years later. Right. Now, whether or not they you know, say we will do an investigation, we will do our best to collect whatever evidence uh, that, that pertains to them. And I, I think that this is uh, what you're getting at here is, you know, where, where you what's prudent for the for legislature to, yeah. to pick as a time period. Uh -huh. and, and based on our experience with complaints, the, va the vast majority of complaints that require any kind of investigation occur well within that year time period. Most of the complaints, um, matter of fact, all the complaints in my uh, experience that occur outside uh, this two-year period are not related to vehicle stops. They're related to court process, to testimony in court, to things like that. So I understand what you're saying. We think this is a safe time period, and we would not advise the council if we did not. Mm -hmm. I believe the CLA's report even yes. gave a, a breakdown of the uh, <laughs> length of time that most complaints get filed after an incident occurs within a one- or two-year period. We have a summary on the bottom of page five of the report uh, that, mm -hmm. that provides a table of uh, an analysis of the complaints. Um, that were received by Internal Affairs in 2007. There were 5,800 complaints received in uh, 2007, and the vast majority of those um, 
the incidents occurred within a 78-day uh, period from the date of the incident. So. Okay. Now, the cost of keeping records, how did, how did you come up with those figures of what the costs are? Should we keep records beyond two years? What we're saving if we keep the in-car video records only for two years? That's the storage costs uh, that was provided to us by IBM. Okay. Now this is provided by IBM when, roughly? When was the estimate provided to us? Yeah. Probably within six months, within the past six months. There, there is an assumption with respect to the amount of video that would be retained. And the video, you know, and I think, you know, uh, Chief Beck can explain this, but, but the video is not running on a continuing basis. There are certain triggers uh, that the department um, will be establishing as part of their policy. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's recorded when the triggers kick in. So it's not running continuously 24 hours a day on every single black and white. So the assumption is that there's going to be approximately seven hours of retention time um, per vehicle per shift. So it's based on that assumption that IBM um, provided the cost estimate um, of the additional $600,000 per year for all 300 vehicles. Okay. And that's for South Bureau? That's for South Bureau only. Okay. <coughs> Is anybody here from IBM? We didn't, we didn't ask okay, that no, IBM we didn't have a vendor. No, I, be present today. I, I, that's in, in looking at the report and, and then looking at the, the information, I want to, I need to know from IBM how they came up with those figures. Not that they're right or wrong. I want to know what assumptions they made. And I want to know what technology they're using for storage. I'm sure they didn't anticipate me asking those questions, but then again. Um, Councilman? Um, Maggie Goodrich from the LAPD is, oh, good. uh, is here, and I think you know, she can answer some of the more uh, technically related uh, kinds of questions that you may have. Okay. We had to set certain um, assumptions for them to give us a proper estimate, and what we assumed is that for each shift, we'd capture five hours of video with the front-facing camera and two hours of video with the, with the um, camera that faces into the rear seat. Um, we believe that that's a very um, conservative estimate in that most departments that have in-car video are only capturing a couple hours a day, no, mm -hmm. nowhere near seven. So we were conservative with that estimate. Um, the storage solution is a uh, near-line uh, automatic tape library storage solution. So basically all we did was take the storage capacity of that tape library, multiply it by the amount of space we need for seven hours of video per shift per car, and came up with these numbers. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, Gene Gamachi, ITA Assistant General Manager. Actually, the uh, IBM storage solution we already have down in the data center. Okay. It's nothing new. It's nothing unusual. Tape line storage as well as regular sand storage is something very common in the data center right now. Mm -hmm. But IBM did confirm that that's what they would be using yes. or recommending to be used? Yes. Okay. And who would be managing that storage? Both us. Uh, we'd be managing storage as well as LAPD. It's, it's, a, it's a joint effort. LAPD and I. I take it. I take. Okay. Um, now you say we already have we're already using that medium right now, yes, and that yeah, system. We have we have, uh, we have that for the mainframe environment as well, and regular sand storage is common both for our mainframe and distributed systems currently. Mm -hmm. And did you go over? Did ITA go over IBM's yes. figures? Yes, we did. Okay, and you concurred. Councilman, can I just make one um, 
one more comment. What we indicated in our report as well is even though we're recommending that the ad code uh, be amended uh, for a two-year minimum, in the scheme of things, it's probably going to be closer to three. And the reason is because before the LAPD can destroy any records, the ad code does require that there be council approval. And um, the average length of time uh, for uh, a recommendation to come before council is provided, based on the information that was provided to me by the city clerk, is approximately a year. So even though it's a two-year minimum retention, the records are going to be there for so at least three years. Officially and I think two years, practically speaking, another bureaucratic year on top of that. Yeah. Right. And I think you may recall a few weeks ago there was a recommendation from the city clerk for records retention of LAPD records for 12,000 boxes that went back to the mid-40s. So, you know, as, as you say, you know, based on sort of the, the bureaucratic length of time, the retention will likely be at least three years and possibly even longer. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Well, I, I don't plan on taking a year, uh, but I am going to reconvene this item in two weeks for this committee. I want to clarify some of the questions that I have. Um, is there anybody at the table right now who is going to be on vacation over the next two weeks in case I have to ask you some questions? Okay. All right. So um, I'm probably going to be... Uh, asking some questions uh, of you um, in the next two weeks, but we will reconvene this item in two weeks in committee um, uh, so that we can finalize this and move it along. Okay? Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, anybody here for item number seven? Public comment. Public comment on item number seven. Item number seven, public comment is open. Seeing and hearing none. Public comment on item number seven is now closed. With that, uh, we'll rehear this item, bring it back to committee in two weeks. Okay. We now move to item number four. Item number four, Board of Public Works report relative to implementing the Leadership and Environmental Design, LEED, silver standard in all newly built or renovated city facilities, 7,500 feet square feet or larger. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Weintraub. I'm Chief Deputy City Engineer from the Bureau of Engineering. Also with me is... Zora Akhtar, Bureau of Engineering. Okay. Uh, we were asked with a council motion in January of 07 to report back on the feasibility of increasing the standard for city-funded projects from LEED certified to LEED silver. And if you go to the end of our report, page 14, uh, you'll see our recommendations. Um, and basically the recommendations are to uh, consider um, increasing the standard to silver for buildings 7,500 square feet or larger projects that would start design after July 1 of 09. Um, request that projects in process continue to use the current standard and, and meet the requirement for LEED certified. Uh, request that council control, and item two, request that council control repart, uh, departments use LEED as a guide for projects smaller than 7,500 square feet and track the points that they're going after. Um, Item three basically permits the um, appropriate lead system to be used because there's a variety of tools that one could use. Item number four asks that um, we get quarterly updates on progress to complying with this. Um, and item five asks we get, that we get the same from non-council con control departments so that we as a city can assess our progress to uh, designing and constructing environmentally sensitive buildings. Item number six requests that the Department of General Services take a look at uh, the lead for existing buildings protocol, which is a green maintenance and operation protocol, and come back uh, with uh, recommendations <coughs> after that review. Item seven asks that building safety work to develop a pilot 
green technology program for city projects so that we could showcase new technologies in city projects uh, and test them and see how well they work. And then lastly, item 8 asks, asks the CAO to work on identifying a fund specifically to offset the cost of the installation of green or vegetated roofs and report back. And we're here to answer any other questions that you might have. Okay. Um, well, one of the things on the report backs, uh, as you mentioned, items one through eight, I think it's important for the report backs to include um, the costs, uh, previous costs compared to the new costs. Hopefully, we'll see a a uh, reduction in in costs, both infrastructure-wise, ongoing, and certainly maintenance costs and things of that nature, so that we can start documenting the cost savings of moving to lead certified buildings uh, rather than uh, not having lead certified buildings. So, on those report backs that you include, uh, that they report. Uh, uh, whatever documentation or whatever they can document on what the cost differentials are in having a building that was perhaps at one time not LEED certified to a building that now is or them perhaps having records of being in a different building that was not LEED certified and then subsequent to being in a LEED certified building so that we can start documenting the cost related to energy, the co ongoing cost related to maintenance and things of that nature. In addition to that, um, on any infrastructure improvements, uh, I think it's important that they start to record uh, and continue to record any cost differentials that may appear when it comes to materials and or uh, construction costs and things of that nature uh, when it comes to achieving LEED certification standards. Uh, we did in the body of the report give you a summary of our experience on some of those issues to date. Um, mm -hmm. And we have 49 active projects, <coughs> LEED projects, and uh, in surveying the program managers for those, we're seeing about a 4% cost increase from 2001 to now for going for LEED certified. Um, it is our opinion that those costs are coming down because everyone's becoming more familiar. The system is becoming more widely used. Mm -hmm. um, to go to silver, we're projecting, because we did a detailed analysis of the points that you would need to add to go to silver, and it would add approximately an additional 2% onto the cost of construction and design. We didn't look at the co uh, any cost savings from maintenance. Okay. Um, well, I think if, if in fact we're going to move into uh, increasing our overall square footage usage uh, and obviously augmenting that year after year after year, I think it's important for us to document that the biggest problem that I that I see is the, with the estimates that we have in the past. The documentation on a grand scale is is doesn't seem to be in existence since I've seen. Um, we have examples of um, of uh, actual cost differentials uh, on a small scale. But what I'm trying to get at is, if we do move forward with this in the city of Los Angeles, we will be able to have a living example and to be able to document that, the, the growth of, of that scale, and then also uh, the overall cost differentials once we are at a, a much larger scale than we are today. Okay. Okay. Is there anybody here to make pub public comment on item number four? Public comment on item number four is now open. Seeing and hearing none, public comment on item number four is closed. Anything else you'd like to add? No? Okay. Um, with that, uh, this committee will refer this matter to the Green Building Team uh, to review and report back um, on this report. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move now to item number five. Item number five, motion Han LaVange relative to directing the CAO to report on the proposed acquisition of the child care center at 10800 South Central Avenue by the Watts Labor Action, Labor Community Action Committee. Anybody here from any of the departments that would like to make any comment on item number five regarding the child care center at 10,800 South Central Avenue? Do 
GSD. Anybody from here from GSD? Anybody? Everything seems to be fine. Just want to see if there's <laughs> any clarification. This is a proposed acquisition by the uh, the agency, mm -hmm. by the Watts Labor Community Action Committee. So it has to go through the surplus process uh, before the property is transferred or sold to them. Okay. Anybody here from the public like to make any comments? Any interested or vested party? Yes, come forward. I'm Tim Watkins from Watts Labor Community Action Committee, and I just appeared to be in order to be supportive in whatever way I might um, assist. Okay. I don't know if there are any questions that you might have of, of us, but. Uh huh. Now, do you currently have a child care center on the premises? Yes, and we've operated it there for over 30 years. So this would be in addition to or a replacement of the current activity of the child care center? This would be to continue the current activity. Okay. So basically just this would help you enhance the quality of service? It's not so much a doubling of capacity or anything like that? It, it, it is actually in order for us to double the capacity, we okay. need to take control. And so that's, that's what it, this is all about. Okay, so it's a matter of upgrading the quality and also the capacity. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what I wanted to clarify. I thought so. I just wanted, <laughs> I just wanted to, to get to that point. Okay. Well, it's a good investment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is anybody here to make public comment on item number five? Item number five public comment is now open. No one here for public comment on item number five. Item number five public comment is now closed. With that, it'll be a recommendation of the chair to approve the item. Okay. We now move to item number nine. Item number nine, report from the GSD relative to assessing the city's security needs and in particular enhanced security at municipal facilities, enhanced security at the West LA Municipal Building, and security cameras for parks. Okay. Anybody here? Good. Gary Newton, Chief of the Office of Public Safety for the Department of General Services. Submitted for review is a comprehensive uh, report assessing the city's security needs. The report consolidates three council motions the first was related to the provisions of enhanced security at municipal facilities. The second was in, re, in regard to the West LA Municipal Building. And the third relates to security cameras for parks. Since the consolidation of security in February 2006, calls for service have increased 131%. And the vast majority of these calls are direct, directly related to service requests and activity within parks and libraries. When the consolidation was in its planning phase, this dramatic increase in call load and corresponding employee workload was not foreseen. In addition, individual security groups that were consolidated were underfunded for required services, and this translates into inherited deficits for GSD. The report's divided into three main areas, current level needs, requested critical needs, and future needs. Uh, since this report was written, the current level needs have been funded in the proposed budget, which were our number one priority. So uh, we, we thank the, the council and, and mayor for uh, funding those priorities. Uh, we understand the city's financial constraints and uh, understand that the requested critical needs and the future needs may have to wait until the city's in a better financial uh, situation. So we are thankful for uh, what, what we did receive in, uh, in this budget as it relates to the current level needs. Okay. Um, so, but when it comes to the, the budget process, the um, contract security and equipment was funded at half the requested amount? Yes, that is correct. The, co okay. the contract security and security technology maintenance uh -huh was funded at half the requested amount, which will significantly 
assist us in carrying out our, our assigned duties. Okay. All right. Appreciate your understanding and um, glad to hear that uh, those funding adjustments were able to uh, to accommodate. Okay. Thank you. Is anybody here you. to make public comment on item number nine? Anybody here to make public comment on item number nine? Seen and hearing none. Public comment on item number nine is now closed. Uh, with that, we'll receive and file the report. Thank you. We now move to item number 10. Item number 10, report from the GST relative to the Department of Transportation's effort to reroute the Dash A line to include Figueroa Plaza. Uh, Chuck Rubin, General Services Asset Management. Um, since we wrote this report in December, um, we're pleased to tell you that uh, DOT has moved forward with rerouting the Dash A. Um, they issued a letter in April um, to general managers of city departments explaining that this was occurring. Uh, I'm told now that the approximate date will be August the 1st. Um, there are already signs up in City Hall shuttle that this is occurring and the work necessary to implement these changes is already underway. So um, um, we're pleased to tell you that this is happening. Okay. And the City Hall shuttle? What's the status there? The City Hall shuttle will terminate at the same time that the Dash A gets rerouted to Fig Plaza. Okay. All right. Okay, and then all that proper notification is and awareness is out there? Yes. About that. Okay. Good. Is anybody here to make public comment on item number 10? We're on item number 10. It's open for public comment. Seeing and hearing none, public comment on item number 10 is now closed. With that, uh, thank you, GST, for that report. We'll note and file that report. We now move to item number 14. Item number 14, GSD report relative to three proposed lease renewals with the Department of Recreation and Parks, Los Angeles Housing Department, and Community Development Department at the Garland Building located at 1200 West 7th Street. Uh, Chuck Rubin, General Services Asset Management. I have with me our team from Studley, um, Mark Sullivan and David Kluth, uh, who are our consultants in assisting us with the Garland lease renewal. Um, we have devised a schedule uh, for relocating the Garland tenants into Figueroa Plaza uh, based on the termination of existing leases as they expire at Fig Plaza. Um, using that schedule we worked backwards to determine how much time the tenants needed to remain at the Garland building uh, until we're able to move them to Fig Plaza. The first group is Reckon Parks uh, coming up in uh, 2009 and um, so we have devised this lease renewal uh, for a 10-year period of time with various parts being able to terminate early such as housing which we expect to bring to Fig Plaza in 2013 so five years from now. Um, similarly, if there's something that happens with CDD early, then we have built-in uh, mechanisms to uh, allow us to change or modify the lease. Okay. Now, um, looking at all of the hopeful timelines when we took on Fig Plaza and made that transaction happen, um, how are our timelines looking now? Our timelines look good. Um, so the pretty, projections very that close we made to what are we had anticipated at correct. that time. Yes. Okay. And costs. Um, costs are in line. Um, the first group, that, well, as far as lease costs are concerned, um, these gentlemen did a huge effort in scouring the entire downtown marketplace. Um, we surveyed some 20 buildings. Uh, we whittled that down to seven. We toured four or five or five, I think, 
um, and negotiated with all of them to make sure that the deal that we were able to get at the Garland was the best deal that we could get. Um, as far as tenant improvement money is concerned, um, it should be noted that there is $4 million in the uh, MICLA funding in 08-09 uh, for the first part, which is Reckon Parks, to move across. Uh, so we would recommend, we would suggest that you uh, recommend removal of our number two as the money is already in 08-09 budget for this purpose. Okay. So we ask that you amend this report. Okay. So we'll consider the report as amended. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, when we were going through the Big Plaza uh, transaction, um, I noted that we had probably been more in more involved internally uh, than ever before. We we covered more bases. We Correct. utilized more outside services. We double checked and triple checked. We actually were. Uh, actually acting more like uh, a private developer would than, than a municipality. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I ask you how our figures look, um, how our estimates seem to be bearing out, et cetera. So in a nutshell, uh, we're, we're comfortable with, with uh, the fact that we had certain expectations. We crossed our fingers, and we're hoping that we were, uh, by and large, on point and, and correct. Yes. Absolutely. So you would say, by and large, um, we are on point. Okay. All right. Um, I'm very proud of the work that the city uh, did, and I'm very uh, happy to know that um, we learned a lot. Uh, people were literally uh, hanging over the edge of the building. Uh, I I understand to literally look at some of the physical <laughs> aspects of Big Plaza. Um, uh, that's how that's how involved we were in that process. So. Um, and again, uh, congratulations, Chuck, uh, for being honored uh, for the work that you do. And again, um, I'm very proud to say that on this transaction and since then, the City of Los Angeles and GSD specifically and engineering and all of the team teams have come together and have done uh, a tremendous job. And I think that the City of Los Angeles is going to be a better tenant for it. I think we're going to be a better property owner. And then we're going to be able to actually ascertain better than ever in the history of the city when we want to be a property owner, why we want to be a property owner, and how it's going to benefit uh, not only the people who work for the city, but ultimately the taxpayer. So uh, again, congratulations. I was looking forward much. to hearing your report. Yes. Council member, on that note, <clears throat> as a result of the acquisition of Fig Plaza, the leasing account for fiscal year 0809 was reduced by $4 million. Mr. Uh, Rubin mentioned that we're going to uh, appropriate from the UB during the next fiscal year $4 million for tenant improvements so we can move the Rec and Parks Department from the Garland building over to the Fig Plaza building. That's going to save an additional $1 million in the leasing account. That's all general fund revenue. Each year. Each year. Each year. Exactly. And see, that that's, that's the difference between the transaction that was before the council before this last time Fig Plaza was before the council because Fig Plaza was before the council more than once and that was one of the reasons why I as a council member uh, did not feel comfortable with the previous transactions because my or and or recommendations etc not that they were good or bad the, the bottom line is I up until this last transaction I didn't feel comfortable that the city of Los Angeles was uh, exercising its talents and its abilities and its, its, its necessity to actually be uh, as, as thorough as we could have been. Uh, and, and I think that the, uh, the last example of moving $4 million to make improvements yet at the same time to save a million dollars a year is certainly uh, the way the city of Los Angeles should operate. Uh, I hope that we can be an example to other municipalities and other uh, levels of government to realize that, that we shouldn't be afraid to be property owners. 
and we should understand that there are times where we want to be a tenant and there are times that we want to be the owners of the property uh, and in the long run understanding that it will benefit the public uh, by making a much more informed decision and a, a well-rounded informed decision rather than just saying well that's just the way we've done it before or uh, we're afraid to venture into the political realm of why we should even propose whether or not we should lease or buy or what have you. So uh, again, congratulations. And uh, I think that, uh, that uh, we all should be proud of, of where we're at today and uh, that next time we make these big decisions, we can feel confident and comfortable that we're utilizing all of those things that we've learned and that we've exercised uh, finally. Um, and even with all of our third party help, Thank you all very much. Uh, we count on you a lot, uh, but at the same time, would you agree that we're a better uh, um, customer uh, because of absolutely uh, us it's exercising a great all plan of our that's talent? Being implemented. What's that? It's a great plan that's being implemented. Okay. Your name I'm again? Be part of it. David Kluth. Okay. And you're with? I'm with the Studley team. Okay. Got it. Thank you. That's just for the record because we are documenting this. <laughs> so thank you very very much. And thank like you. I said, I was looking forward to this report. Thank you um, very much. With, what's that? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, is there anybody here to make public comment on item number 14? Item number 14 is open for public comment. Seeing and hearing none, public comment on item number 14 is now closed. With that, uh, there will be a recommendation of the chair to approve the GSD report as amended. Very good. Okay. We now move to item number 15. Item number 15, motion Garcetti Rosendahl relative to directing the CAO with the assistance of ITA and the city attorney to report on the status of the use of electronic signatures in city business. Okay. Electronic signatures. Good afternoon. Mark Wolf with ITA. Jim House, CAO's office. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I could open with a little history on the project. We've. Um, this is the, the second time we've taken a look at digital signatures. Back a, around eight years ago, around Y2K, there was a project to uh, look at digital signatures, and the state and the federal government were also looking at it at that time. And there was a pilot proposed that would have required the expenditure of some money for some software and putting in place some hardware infrastructure to run it on. And at that time, it didn't look like the uh, field was evolving as fast as predicted and that it was probably prudent to hold off uh, spending any money uh, on it at the time. And uh, I think things have evolved quite a bit since that time and I think now is a good time to take another good look at how, whether we should proceed and how we should proceed mm -hmm. with, a, with a project. So I, I think we feel uh, jointly with ITA that it would be worth uh, giving us a little bit of time to report back, a few weeks to look in and update what we uh, provided eight years ago okay. and see what changes to the field have occurred and, and whether, you know, it's a prudent, cost-effective thing to proceed with. How much time would you recommend to this committee that you would need? I'd like to request uh, at least 30 days, if we could. At least 30 days? Okay, I know everybody's a little burned out with the process that just finished yesterday. So. 30 days works for you? Yeah, that's okay. fine. All right. So um, with that, is there any public comment on item number 15? Anybody here for public comment on item 15? Seeing and hearing none, public comment on item 15 is now closed. Um, with that, we will be uh, taking this item and putting it back on the agenda with a report back from uh, a CAO with ITA and the city attorney's office. And uh, we'll hear this item hopefully in 30 days. Okay. Thank you. We now move to <clears throat> the supplemental special agenda. We have one item on that agenda. Item 16, Information Technology Agency report relative to proposed amendment number one to contract number C-108205 with the EMC Corporation to provide services in connection with the implementation of various document management initiatives. Okay. Good afternoon, Mark Wolf. Rita Corona Carwa, ITA. Rosa Cepeda, CAL. Okay. Good afternoon, Council Member. The report that's before you is for requesting approval of a personal services contract amendment to EMC's <coughs> document management services to be continued an additional year beyond the original three-year term of the contract. 
the city selected EMC Documentum software as the citywide solution for document and content management and has put in place a personal services contract for implementation services back in June of 2005. The city leveraged the federal government's general services administration contract, their master contract agreement for implementation of these services. Since the contract was established, there has been a number of successful city implementations with Documentum, including public works street lighting, sanitation, ethics, controller's office, and ITA's video services division. A few departments have current engagements that are pending completion. These projects were funded in the past fiscal years, and examples include the police department, city attorney, office of finance. The contract is scheduled to expire in June, uh, June 30th of this year, and the contract limit with the amendment that is before you will remain unchanged. No additional funding is required for this contract amendment, and ITA is requesting council to authorize execution of the amendment to extend services to June 30th, 2009. So this is an ex a request for an extension of time, not uh, money? Okay. That is correct. All right. Um, does ITA have any idea what uh, has taken so long for the county's EMC contract? and when the county plans to move forward. Any knowledge on that? Um, I'll let my colleague respond to that question because she's the one that's been in conversations okay. with him. Um, LA County has indicated it may take them two more months. Your name again? Rita Karana Karwa. I'm mm -hmm. on the document management project. And uh, county indicated it could take them two more months, but we're going to start exploring other options because it's already been six months since we've been waiting. Oh, OK. All right. Um, does ITA have a backup plan in case uh, they're not able to piggyback on the county's contract, if you're not able to piggyback on the county's contract? Yes, we are exploring a uh, San Diego contract and also California MSA. Uh, and worst case scenario, we may have to do an RFP, uh, and which may take longer. Uh -huh. but we have options. OK. All right. OK, any other, anything else you'd like to add? Just as a point of clarification, the contract expires on June 6th, and so we're asking That's for a one-year extension okay. to, to June 6, 2009. Not the 30th, but My the My mistake. Sixth. So, yeah, OK. All right. So um, uh, before I take any action, is there any public comment on item number 16, the supplemental special agenda? Seeing and hearing none, uh, public comment on this item is now closed. Um, with that, um, it would be a recommendation of the chair to approve the ITA report and request a placeholder for the next regular council meeting and instruct the CAO's office to prepare a report to council on this matter. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. With that, that concludes the items scheduled for today's agenda. And now we will go to general public comment. We do have a public comment card for general public comment. We have uh, Richard Dapsey. Yes. Yes. Good afternoon, council member. Your name again for the record? My name is Richard Dapsey. I work for North Hill Networks. My name is German Torres with Verizon in support of any questions that there might be. Well, on general public comment, uh, since it's not a uh, scheduled item, we can hear uh, public comment, but um, it's difficult for us to uh, dialogue with you on it. Because right, of we're the asking for, for governance and, and review. Okay, so if you want to add to any comments within your two minutes, please do so. Yeah. Okay, great, sure. So our purpose today is to seek uh, committee's governance and review of ITA's award, pending award for two AT&T and Cisco for the new emergency operations center. Uh, Nortel and Verizon are requesting the committee chair to instruct ITA management to outline their analysis and produce ITA documents that can support their decision. Specifically, Nortel requests submittal to committee the following ITA created documents. Public works building voice over IP lessons learned. I believe we've attached that to the speaker card. I, um, ITA staff recommendations for voice over IP deployment. 
EOC underscore Nortel Cisco Avaya side-by-side -side comparison. There are varying versions of that. Version 10 was the last one. These documents compile AT ITA's staff's diligent analysis, inclusive of independent Gartner consultant review, to support their purchasing decision. Our understanding is that none of these documents recommend that ITA make the decision to purchase the AT&T and Cisco solution for EOC. Fact is, these documents clearly recommend Verizon and Nortel. In 2005, this committee vacated the request for proposal for the Public Works Building's voice over IP implementation. ITA's general manager insisted that this building be used for a Cisco voice over IP pilot as Nortel already had numerous voice over IP applications already in production and did not need to be reviewed under the pilot. Council Member Jack Weiss, the previous chair of the ITGS, instructed ITA to report back to the committee on the results of this pilot. Please read the lessons learned document as it highlights the failed ROI, return on investment, lack of functionality, and the remiss support provided by both vendor as well as ITA. The results of this pilot are clear. The cost overrun was over $2 million. The system at the Public Works Building continues to monopolize ITA staff resources as trouble ticket generation is disproportionately high. This means an extremely high cost of ownership. Continue. What, Go ahead. Continue. What about EOC? Over the past two and a half years, Verizon and Nortel have been providing the ITA and LAPD new systems under bond-funded bond propositions. All are either using voice over IP technology or voice over IP capable. Today, 20 of 23 new and refurbished LAPD facilities are installed and the voice over IP network framework is almost complete. Already delivering five nines of reliability to the city, we've proven that to ITA and we've proven that to LADP. The decision by IT is unfounded and setting up the city for additional waste of time, money, and resources. Please review. Okay. And just uh, to note, you did submit a document labeled Public Works Building Dash uh, Lessons Learned. Yes, right. that was that was submitted by it's public record. It was yeah. submitted. Okay. okay, and I do have that document. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much for coming forward and for your testimony. Is there anybody else here for general public comment to this committee? Seeing and hearing none. General public comment to this committee is now closed. With that, we are now adjourned.